to Jerry. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this uh, sort of a video interview with me and um, and so more of a like an oral history rather that I want to uh, capture a few things about you. And so, um, okay, you know, Mehdi, I worked with you. So what we I want to first start is maybe when you started at Bell Labs. Let's start from there and we'll go to your childhood later on. So we'll go in a little bit backward direction. So tell All us right. when you started at Bell Lab and we'll go from there. Tell us a little All bit right. about it. So I, I started at Bell Labs in 1972. Um, okay. I had just come out of the army um, actually for only about a year and a half. I worked briefly for a think tank in Washington, D.C., Arlington. It was a very good place to work in many ways, but I, I didn't particularly care for, you know, the kind of studies that they were doing, you know, about nuclear war and so forth. And I had for several years tried to, um, you know, to, to uh, interview with Bell Labs. And at the time of 1972, it was very, uh, you know, minimal economy and jobs were very scarce. But luckily, um, I don't know if you ever knew Steve Katz, but Steve Katz agreed I do. I to, did. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. you know, to interview me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of strange. I, I, I always wanted to go to Bell Labs and you know, one day I was sort of browsing in this place that I worked briefly, the Institute for Defense Analysis. And uh, I was paging through some books and came across um, something about information theory and, you know, how Bell Labs had been the uh, the prime mover of that. And then it just dawned on me, well, <laughs> you got to go uh, try again for Bell Labs. So, so I did. And... Um, Steve Katz was kind enough to agree to, you know, interview me, even though, you know, he was, they were very restricted on hiring at Bell Labs. He had to get all kinds of special permissions. So anyway, I went to interview and I did get the job. And, um, you know, I started out at Homedale, New Jersey, which okay. had, I don't know if you ever had a chance to go there, but it's a, a beautiful physical building, you know, um, designed by this architect, a rather famous uh, Aero Saron, and, and um, it, it had a very open inside architecture uh, with hallways that reminded some people of a prison, you know, sort of like you were walking within a huge open area. And, um, but to me, it was very appealing, very beautiful building. It had a, a kind of a mirror-like outside um, reflecting at night you could you know and in, at night you could see into the building itself so it was it was a wonderful starting place to to go and, you know, yeah that's very yeah, few remember i started in that building, uh -oh. uh, in 87 i was also started under you in 1987 so did you hear me Yes, I can yet. Uh, so um, great. So um, so what got you interested in dynamic routing, call routing? Well, <laughs> it, it wasn't entirely my my design. I you know I so it's, I said I started in 1972 at Bell Labs, and uh, it was lucky enough um, in 1976 that. Um, I, I was promoted to a, a supervisor, and it happened to be under a very forward-looking gentleman, Vern Munmer. I don't know if you ever met him, but uh, you know he he hired me to supervise a, a new group. Um, this was at the time that switching electronic switching, the number four ESS switch had just first been introduced into AT&T one year before that and common channel signaling, which is, you know, the data network underlying the, switch, the electronic switching, they had just come into being. So this group that Vern Mummer started was to look into new routing 
architectures. You know, this is a totally new subject that uh, just came about because of electronic switching, switching and common channel signaling. And fortunately for me, I was hired to do that. And there were th only three people to start with, some uh -huh. excellent people. Um, yeah. Rich Cardwell and um, um, Alan Westreich and Pam Turner. You know, they were three of the charter members of my group. And, uh, you know, there really wasn't anything. It was sort of given an open charter as to, you know, go, go find, you know, what we should be doing in, you know, in rooting in the arc and the network that takes advantage of this electronic switching and common channel signaling. And uh, right. there had been, you know, bits and pieces of studies mm -hmm. that were looking at, you know, sort of very localized pieces of the problem, which, you know, I had to start by understanding all that and, uh, you know, working on some more basic overall network design and uh, rooting architectures. I mean, it was a very all-encompassing charter. It was kind of given mm -hmm. carte blanche to, you know, do whatever, do whatever you think you need to do. And I had very talented people mm -hmm. help me figure that out. I mean, to assist them in figuring it out was a more better way to put it. And um, Vern Mummert was, you know, he was, he was very astute. I thought, you know, he wasn't a, a deep technical guy, but he, he was a very good manager, I thought. He just sort of, mm -hmm. you know, let well enough alone, uh, you know, let these people do their thing. I mean, he kept track of it and make sure everything was progressing, but you right. know, he didn't micromanage or anything like that. So. I mean, I got to it fortuitously. I mean, I was handed this opportunity. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like I said, well, I want to work on dynamic routing. Right, right. Got it. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was a, a totally new subject. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had to start from there, from the existing studies and, you know, really look at a broad spectrum of things. At that time, the, uh, you know, the ARPANET and, I mean, the internet wasn't really there yet in right. 1976, but you know mm -hmm. there were all these ideas around, and and you know that was part of what we had to do as a group was to look into all these different ideas. And uh, the internet coming into under the horizon was there, but not a very important thing at that time. Right. <laughs> it right. became right. much more important later, obviously. Right. Anyway, so that's how it got, got started. So, uh, I mean, it took uh, several years of study and understanding for a variety of reasons, because as you said, you are looking at the signaling system. That's something new for ESS switch, you know, uh, also new, right? And so I think you end up writing a paper in 1981, if I remember, with Richard Carwell. You know, that's a famous paper that I, I remember reading it. So, yeah. uh, so can you tell us about putting that paper together and, you know, what uh, kind of decisions you have to make after you did the study, I think, so. Right. Yeah, that was a basic paper in the, in the uh, Bell System Technical Journal, which was, you know, that really was, you know, I, I consider that a really big achievement because it wasn't easy to get a paper into the BSTJ. I mean, that was, these were mostly very research good. division people writing very theoretical stuff. But, you know, by the time of 1981, yeah, we had done some very basic studies already and, um, you know, done some models that showed, uh, you know, the potential overall the savings and efficiencies that would come could could come about with dynamic routing. We use small network models. I remember a 28 mm -hmm. switch node model mm -hmm. that um, you know was sort of underlying and basic to the whole study. Um, you know, Rich Cardwell, you know, he he was so so good. I mean, he had already um, developed 
a very sophisticated um, linear programming optimization model for you know designing these dynamic routing networks and you know that paper contained those kinds of results and um, you know it it kind of uh, set the whole stage for progressing to the implementation so I remember this paper caught the attention of Mr. Schwartz uh -huh. at, yes. at Columbia, Columbia University. University. So that, that uh -huh. was a big deal. He, yeah, of course. He, he called me and invited me up to give a seminar to his to his class. And uh -huh. that, was, that was quite stimulating. I mean, he I had contact with him throughout the years. He was a really very nice guy, mm -hmm. obviously a genius. And um I thought, and uh, you know that 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 that, that uh, opportunity to, to present to his class and to him. I mean that that really was, uh, I think, opening opening the door to to a bigger audience, uh, right. so to mm -hmm. speak. It just began to well, this this began to be more interesting to people. You know, the BSTG article, I think, caught, caught a lot of attention. And, uh, yeah. That's interesting. I did not know that uh, story about Misha Schwartz inviting you to give a talk. So this is uh, yeah. also new, new for me, you know, so that's exciting. And the third author on that paper was uh, Murray. I forgot his first name. Yeah, yeah. Bob, Murray. Murray. Bob Murray, right. Mm -hmm. Bob Murray, along with, uh, you know, he was very involved in like the network optimization, linear programming. Mm -hmm. Very, very smart guy. And uh, Rich Wong was Richard Wong was the other, you know, pioneer in this. One of the most basic problems with this whole idea that you know we were trying to introduce dynamic routing and multi-hour design and all that was huge optimization. Right. The, the, the AT and T network. Network was very very big, mm -hmm. and, you know. Twenty eight switch model. Yes, you could you could solve a linear program, simplex method, and so forth, in a reasonable time. Even though it was you know it wasn't a short time, right. the, like a hundred and thirty five switch network, which is the size of the four ESS network at that time. I mean that was that was too large scale, right? So mm -hmm. Bob Murray and Rich Wong in particular were the, the two that, you know, figured out very efficient heuristic techniques to solve the linear program problem in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I think was more than anything, the, the quote breakthrough <laughs> that people, some people called it, that you mm -hmm. can do this optimization for such mm -hmm. a full scale network um, and make it uh, practical. Yeah. No, that's, Bob that's, Bob that's, yeah, so there, there are a couple of things I'm hearing from you just to kind of do a quick recap. One is that formulating the optimization problem was very important. It was a very large problem to solve. Right. And be able to find out what the heuristic was also very important. Right. Yeah. So, and I believe the, the optimization problem you are trying to solve is to show the benefit of both the routing as well as the the capacity needed in the network right in terms of the cost benefit of it correct correct, correct. yes mm -hmm. yes i mean the the design problem you know in the in the in the bell system network was always you know to well minimum cost i mean it, 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 roughly right <laughs> um don't I mean, I guess I get into you know the, the difference of philosophy that you know in the uh, in the internet when I started to get into that in the uh, in the 1990s, uh, mm -hmm. the internet started to really become dominant. You know, the philosophy of you know the inter uh, internet people we I like to call them netheads. <laughs> we were I remember heads. that they were right. they were we were bellheads. They were netheads. They said, well, just put out capacity. You know, it's very cheap. 
just put yeah. it out, uh, you know, infinite capacity. You never have to worry about the design. But in the in our in our uh, way of doing it in the Bell Network, you know, you, you're paying for the capacity. It's very expensive, you know, right. millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, and uh, and so minimum cost was a primary objective. Of course, that's only one side of the coin. I mean, the other side is once you put the capacity out there, you know, the routing algorithm has to 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 take the most advantage of what whatever's there. So Absolutely. Uh, maximum flow. I mean it, like, uh, can you tell us what was the cost savings on your initial estimate with dynamic routing and the rough ballpark? You know, yeah, and I think it was more, I mean, the, the the early models, the 20 year switch network showed a potential of, you know, in the range of 15 to 20%. I, I think mm -hmm. it was at least 15%. And it was given the scale of the, you know, the AT&T network, which is hundreds of millions of dollars. I've forgotten the figure. And Frank Field did some very detailed, credible studies of, mm -hmm. of the savings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, using economic principles and cost of money and, uh, you know, all the right ways of doing it. And I mean, it was hundreds of millions of dollars because of the very large investment in uh, transport capacity. Absolutely. Absolutely. 15 to 20 percent, I think. That's yeah. Fantastic, right. Okay, so let's uh, move on to what was the then the challenge that now you showed that it is economical to do it to be able to go and wanting to deploy in at and network. Right. So what was the challenge there and what who did you have to convince to make <laughs> that work, uh, Jerry? <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent question. That, that, that probably far and away was the biggest challenge of all. And there's, there's no easy answer to that. Um, a lot of people, I mean, over a very long period of time, because, you know, underlying this, you're, you're fundamentally changing the whole network. It's not just a routing algorithm, but it's the whole design and management and provisioning, everything that, you know, encompassing the network would change. And so one person that was uh, particularly central to the decision was the vice president, Billy Oliver. He was a vice president of, um, at the time it was called Long Lines. They were in charge of the long distance network. Mm -hmm. He was a very car colorful Southern gentleman. And he was famous for, you know, getting his way by, you know, schmoozing with everybody by, you know, calling a meeting and bringing in a, a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> I, I see, okay. Those things help, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Billy Oliver, I mean, I didn't really get to know him personally at first, but I did later um, because actually we were recipients, co-recipients of an award where he was the other recipient of introducing uh, dynamic routing into the AT&T network. But he was in a position, you know, to make a, a big decision, you know, that, that they're going to go ahead with this. And I remember, well, there were a lot of people, many people that were, you know, opposed to this. It was, you know, you're changing everything. And there was one particular gentleman that was in the, the network management division. I mean, these are the people who sit there be, before these great big video displays of real time information in the network and and Dick Esri, he was wedded to, you know, it was a hierarchical routing network that had been there from the beginning, right. you know, mm -hmm. with uh, right. Alexander Graham Bell. And we're going to throw away the hierarchical network, you crazy. And <laughs> he was putting up a big, big resistance. And, uh, mm -hmm. So Billy Oliver, I mean, I didn't know at first, I didn't, but he admitted later he removed the Gezri. He put him in some other That's place. Right. He, didn't, he didn't fire him, but wow, put him somewhere else where he couldn't be, you know, quite quite a, a big thorn in everybody's side. And um, 
so that means that one one aspect of, but there were some very high level meetings with there was the long lines Billy Oliver, but then there was the AT and T management. I mean, very high level up to. I guess we got up to uh, a guy, uh, Vice President Dick Huff, big big meeting, and uh, you know I I went along. I was there to answer questions. Fern Mummer gave the presentation. Okay. <laughs> There are a lot of questions I had to answer, and um, it was, you know, in this very amazing kind of a Taj Mahal that AT and T had at the time in their central headquarters, and it was a great big, you know, wonderful room with all these high-level guys up there, and you know, so Vermeer gave the presentation, and and and. Nothing was put in the way, you know, I guess it was sort of like, okay, you guys can go ahead, but I don't think, I mean, that doesn't necessarily constitute a final decision. You know, things had to happen in the way of, of, of all the system support. You know, there are the real-time network management systems, right. design systems, all these things have to be modified. Right. And the uh, switches themselves had to be programmed. I mean, right. this was uh, people in Indian Hill who who did the uh, you know the actual coding of switch software. And, yeah, uh, for you, for uh, yes, the software. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think yeah, Billy Oliver and Dick Huff meetings and you know and and. So many presentations, uh, you know, sort of just progressed. And um, I guess when they finally decide that they're going to actually develop the software, that's sort of like maybe the final decision. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. going to put this into the switches okay. and then it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that was the final thing that the final decision had to be made. Mm -hmm. Get the software development into the switch. So. Which is expensive. That's a that's a, that's a lot of absolutely. That's yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of money. Not only that, it's a, a software development of the. We're talking about early '80s. You know, that's long, forty years back. You know, so right. In terms of complexity of doing it, as well as the cost right. of doing, it, both are difficult. Very yeah, we had some really mm -hmm. top top guys. It, it was Indian Hill. Um, in Chicago area, that these people for network systems that program the program the four ESS, they were just such top people, right. so smart, and um, you know, so, they stuck around. Actually, is one of them, really? Rich, Rich Elts. Uh, I think he still works for AT and T. And wow, I think a few years ago he. He took the software that had been originally developed for, you know, dynamic routing and yeah. moved it over to new switch processors that they put in the network. I don't know the details of this. This happened after, long after I was gone. Wow. But he actually he converted, converted the software oh, from one platform to another. And uh, as far as I know, that's that's what's operating now in the circuit switch network. I'm not Absolutely, Absolutely sure, because I'm not close to it anymore. I right. like to, I like to get updated if you know, now and then. <laughs> right. It's, so then uh, the first deployment uh, was about 1984 in the smaller 10 or 12 node network. If yeah, I it was a 10 node network, yeah, it was. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember well. It was uh, July 14th, 1984. Yeah, it was Bastille. Wow. Bastille Day. <laughs> Bastille Day, okay. Bastille Day, yeah. And, um, <laughs> so. Yeah, I remember it was at the top of the hierarchical network. So those are what they're known as regional centers. And normally there should be no blocking up there. And so it was like, I mean, that would be probably the least risk. And Everything went well that day. I remember they had a, a hotline, an 800 number you could call in, and somebody would give a periodic report of, you know, how the network was 
behaving. Okay. Actually, the it made the national news. I was told. I didn't hear it myself, but somebody told uh -huh. me they heard something about AT and T, uh, puts in a new dynamic reading system and something, you know, to that effect on the news. So it was a big deal that day. You know. Yeah. Did you sleep, lose your sleep the first day? It was going to be fired up, uh, or do you have any? Do you think you lost your sleep or anything that stayed up all night to see if it is well? These, to be okay? uh, yeah, these yeah, cutovers these cut were done in the middle of the night, so right. I, I went to every one of them. That, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that one I wasn't. Now that you bring it up, <laughs> I, I was somewhere else. I was calling in, but you know, normally, yeah. I mean, there were several phases of this thing. Right, it wasn't right. fully deployed until like 1987, at least the right. DNHR part. Right, and and the cutovers were the middle of the night, and it was up in Bedminster, New Jersey, in this network management center where they have you know these big displays and real-time right. data and they see everything happening in real time and uh you know so i, I, like I remember to go to going things. there seeing it yeah i go there and yeah in 87 when i joined i saw it there oh, you did know. you go yeah i went to bad minister in 87 when i joined uh, you know your group oh, you know, yeah. yeah so you're familiar with it you're yeah but i remember i think it was part of our orientation actually yeah uh, you know that we went and uh, saw it so and at that time it was pretty impressive to have big displays with everything about the network the blocking you know between points and you know that that itself is a major very, very, very impressive yeah, yeah. so and with the uh, with the dynamic routing that whole that whole center was completely transformed i mean because it was a whole way new way of visualizing and networking you get point to point blocking and you know right much right. more detail right uh, data there were some really you know very very intelligent and it was one network manager who was famous up there jack doodash i don't know if you met jack but he was like the main guy and he just he just knew everything about everything about managing the network you know some problem happened, you know, an earthquake or some overload or cut, he would um, know exactly what to do, what controls to put in. And so, mm -hmm. you know, he was, I mean, they had a whole crew of people up there, but he was like the number one guy, Jack Dudash. So, no, that's very interesting. So, um... Uh, you you did, you did talk about Billy Oliver, and so I mean you talk about you know you downplayed the the, the award or the medal you got, this, which is actually the uh, very 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 prestigious um, award, which is known as the you know Alexander Graham Bell Medal from IEEE. Right. You know, so that's with Billy Oliver. I believe that was in nineteen. Uh, 89 that you got that right. award from exactly right. I would say, which is like getting a Nobel Prize in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, so. sir, it felt very, very good. I was, I was, you know, extremely surprised. And, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> it, it, it was a huge honor, and, um, mm -hmm. and yes. you know, it represented the work of so many people that had done such great work. I mean, I, I got an award, but it's really for the project. It's, <laughs> right. it's for all these people like you and everybody that I had the privilege to work with, uh, you know, did all this, so. And Billy Oliver, that's when I started to get to know him better, because, you know, like I said, I didn't really know him personally, but mm -hmm. with that award, yeah. I mean, you know, we got together. He, invited me to lunch and he, he was very interested in you know what was happening right in mm -hmm. detail at the, at the time we were looking at we hadn't yet just done you know next phase of real-time network routing but we were looking at things like real-time dynamic routing uh right so trunk status map routing and right. he, he was very interested in that right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so so uh, maybe uh, Jerry, you can say a little bit about RTNR or real-time network routing. What got you interested to switch from DA nature to RTNR? And is there something, you know, I mean, of course there are new challenges there, but what do you think was not in your view was not working with the nature that RTNR is the, you felt like the next step to go. And I came at that time and worked with you. So I have my personal experience, but I want to hear from your uh, viewpoint. So, sure. You know. Well, that's a very excellent question. Um, the genesis of RTNR was from um, a very, I mean, I have all these extremely smart people. Alan Fry at um, Network Systems in Indian Hill is a, a developer of the 4ESS. He conceived of the basic idea of RTNR is uh, it's a real time exchange of information. And he realized that, you know, the 4ESS uh, had the capability to map the status of every link from a switch right. into, a, into a bitmap. <laughs> right. And with that bitmap, you could compare status at two ends of a connection. Right. Uh, and figure out which was the best uh, available path through the network. So he came up with this idea and, um, he started promoting it. Uh, you know, he he was a network coding guy, so mm -hmm. he didn't. But this was a, a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it just sort of came out of the blue. Uh, right, very he, interesting. Uh, he started, you know, talking about RTNR. He even invented the name right away. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah real -time network <laughs> I did not know it was Alan Fry who invented the name too. Yeah, so. Alan Fry <laughs> conceived the idea. And yeah. um, well, you know, when it started to get some attention, got a lot of attention, people expected me to say, well, that's no good, you know, we already have DNA <laughs> chart. <-HR." laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> well, actually, um, I could see, you know, because we had done all these studies, I mean, we saw how real time network status. Like I mentioned, you know, we've been looking at things like the what we call trunk status map routing, right. mm -hmm. which had a lot of the same flavor as what um, the uh, Canadians were doing with dynamically controlled routing. You know, right? Like this year, mm -hmm. you know, that def definitely gave you an advantage. It gave network efficiencies both in the uh, capacity design and in, in optimizing flow. Right. So, you know, I embraced the idea, um, and it, you know, I guess besides people expecting me not to like it because I was going to defend DNHR dynamic routing mm -hmm. implementation, this already happened. Uh, but um, that I, you know, I wouldn't work on it or whatever. So maybe there were different people who were interested in you know, picked up on RTNR and uh, they started to say, you know, well, I'm going to start modeling this. So it became sort of like, well, there were different groups that were going to start looking at this and no, no, no we plan to implement it, but let's, let's do some modeling. And so I got very interested myself actually and did some simulations, models and, um, I don't know, it turned out to be, well, it was sort of a competition there in the beginning to get the first model results. And so, you know, that, that was one aspect of it. Um, I don't know what else to say about RTNR is that, you know, it was again, a, a decision of, yeah. of deciding to spend all the money to implement it. And, right. uh, that's right. But it, I think it, probably the fact that it was the switching software was done as a part of the NHR that 
quote unquote increment was probably easier to make that jump, you know, and also probably the management had more trust on you because you have <laughs> delivered something <laughs> with DNHR. I presume that and, played and a role. There's probably, probably some truth in that. Yeah. I mean, one of the arguments was that, yeah, you didn't have to change everything in the network. The, right. the, the management systems and everything that had been changed, converted already. Right. Pretty much compatible with, you know, a, a, a new routing algorithm. Yeah. So what was the big thing was developing the software again. You had to make the decision to develop this, and if you know it, it's it's very expensive, uh, and that was kind of the key decision, I suppose, that, that go ahead and develop the software in the Fourier SS switch, mm -hmm. and all the studies that it went into it that showed that you know you got better flow through the network, you got a better efficient design, uh, you know, and a lot of oh, studies yeah. to support it mm -hmm. um, led to, let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. So I, I, just for the audience, I want to uh, mention something that I forgot to mention, that dynamic non hierarchical routing DNHR was a time dependent routing. That means the right. routing table changed Roughly about every hour, not exactly. It was sliced into, I think, uh, 15 hours during the day or something like that. And then we can do the load set period. But with real time network routing, it basically become uh, on a par call basis changes. But there was a caveat because I worked for you, Jerry, from 1987 to 89. The caveat was that they thought that getting the update from the switch is going to be so far delayed that the call, people will think their call is not going to get connected in the, you know, uh, when you, uh, human being expect the, uh, the ring to show up. So there was a modification that was done. And, and the, so do you remember that? The modification was that okay. actually you're going to use one call old information. Yes, yes. yes. that's right. <laughs> yeah, very good, you had excellent memory and uh, yes, that was a very important uh, decision because you're right. I mean, that was an argument that this this is bad because you about the delay. You don't want any delay, and uh, and that just raises another interesting point. <laughs> you know, some of the <laughs> some of the simulations, a lot of the simulations that I could never explain it. This is a problem. Maybe you can figure out. Showed that you know this modification of using the last update actually improved the network performance <laughs> really yeah yeah oh, no, I, no, no, no. not 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 by not by a lot i mean it was marginal but i think it, i have an answer to that i did simulate later on after i left bell lab so that sometimes if it is too greedy uh, yeah. then it is not actually yeah. as yeah. good because yeah. you are yeah. Grabbing yeah. something you should not be grabbing capacity. Yeah, I think you're. So exactly I wrote the right. paper in 2001 or two yeah. uh, because I was still trying to understand from as you know that yeah. what. I think you're right. Right, so that you but it's great. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's it, and you maybe disproved it. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't disprove it, but I think it sometimes you know. No, I, I, uh, I that's what my feeling was too. You know. Yeah. Okay. Really Great. I'm glad we I confirmed that. You know, I didn't know because I thought oh, yeah. it was a drug because my thought was that initially when I was uh, working uh, in your group that okay we need to cut down the call set of time. That's it, and so we are going to take hit on the performance of the you know how many calls get through. I said okay. But yeah. only later on, when I was studying it, like almost eight, ten years later, I, you know, building my own simulator to understand this more, why, yeah. you know, things matter, and yeah. that, that's when I found out. That's great. So uh, we have. Uh, the, so let's uh, switch to your next thing that you eventually move, become uh, working with NetHeads on the IETF from <laughs> yeah. from there on. So what was the move and? And I believe you worked a lot on MPLS related stuff. Do you want to quickly tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's, that's another interesting, you know, be, like 
I said, I mean, when I started this work on dynamic routing, the, the, net, the internet was, you know, just, just the ARPANET and it was, you know, some very small uh, networks and it didn't really start to come into significance until like the 1990s. So, and, you know, I was working also on standards, you know, sort of in parallel with doing this network uh, routing studies and DNHR and RTNR and all that, but worked with the ITU and um, there was an interest in, uh, I don't know how it got started in bringing some of the dynamic routing technology said, well, we ought to go talk to the internet people <laughs> about this, this technology we have, we have, you know, all this knowledge and, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to tell them how to do it and everything. Um, and I guess I maybe was an instigator or I got elected, I'm not sure to go to a, there was the Internet Engineering Task Force, IATF, which, you know, kind of was the engineering basis for the internet. They did all the the RFCs and, and the algorithms and for the most part. There are other right. standards, right. but they, mm -hmm. so I went to a meeting, I think it was in the early 90s, to talk about some of the technology and talk about DNHR and RTNR. And at that time, you know, you went to an IETF meeting, the internet was just coming into a big, really big deal. Yeah. And these meetings were huge. I mean, right. everybody showed up, including a lot of the press, you know, the, the, wow. the media showed up. Right. And I, and I remember I had a presentation at the, um, one of the sessions, I don't know if you went to an INTF meeting, but there was a multi-protocol label switching MPLS working group, right. which right. was really the place most applicable to talk about this. So I went and gave a talk and it was sort of like you know, the basic network design routing talk. And I remember the reaction, I, I, I really, I just got told later, about people complaining about this, well, this this bellhead coming in and talking to the, all these all these internet people. <laughs> you know, there was a real clash of cultures. At That's that true. That's and, true. Uh, and the, the room was filled to the. I mean, it was must have been a thousand people there, and people standing in the back, and you know, here's your audience, and you know, that was kind of the feedback I got. It was uh, well, gee, you know. Who's he to come and tell us anything like that? And, <laughs> but, you know, maybe that was the start. And it, it never, you know, it, it improved a lot over. I began to work in standards more, and particularly in the IETF. And uh, I participated in, in a lot of the working groups. They had, you know, different uh, places. Uh, the MPLS working group, the generalized MPLS working groups that talk about, you know, diff serves, uh, traffic engineering, where, I mean, and I, I worked, you know, on uh, those standards, internet standards for probably 10 years and uh, co-authored quite a few RFCs. And uh, right. mm -hmm. um, yeah, I found it very interesting and I, I made a lot of good contacts there. I mean, these people oh. were really, really brilliant and uh, you know, I have very good memories of that. And, and actually, you know, um, other people, and I was still supervising a group, other people sort of in my group, you know, took interest from the IT that they didn't stop working on the IT, but more oh going to the IETF and working in, in the, uh, mm -hmm. the right. IETF on the internet. I mean, it was a, a transition from the, the circuit switch world to you know, the packet world. Right. And that was kind of, I saw, I lived through that transition. No, fantastic, you know. Quite, you to and lightning. 
yeah, different things and uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, how it has changed, you know, for uh, from one network to another network and different ways to do philosophy rather to do it. You know, you say it's something about they say, oh, just throw capacity in there. Don't worry about capacity yeah. from the when you thought the capacity was important, you know, yeah. and capacity is still important like, because it matters in terms of cost. But, you know, now you think from an opportunity cost as well because we are in a competitive world and, you know, so right. those things matter. So this is this is very, very interesting for me because, you know, when I came and joined your group in 87, I don't know what uh, was uh, got into your head. You said that, you know, Deep, you know, it'll be fine. You can come work for me. And I said, oh, I don't know anything about routing. He said, oh, you, I remember in the interview, you said that, you know, it doesn't matter. You have an optimization background and you can pick up the rest. <laughs> and and yeah, that, that, was, that was a great opportunity for me personally. To, to... Yeah, but that was, that was the, the way, I mean, everybody that, I mean, I was so privileged to, you know, what I was really good at was spotting good people. <laughs> that was what I was best at. And, you know, I had some of the finest people working in the group, including you, that, you know, just took off and solved these problems and did papers. And, you know, many like you went on to higher things and professors and you know became higher managers and uh, did all these things i mean it's a, a sense of pride to look back on it and, you know think about you know i had some influence um, well, it's, it's to, sure to, be to, to actually you know start uh, be smart enough to say well come join the group and <laughs> and show me what you can do no, that was, you know, it was very, I mean, for me personally, I learned a lot because about understanding the practical aspect, how to imagine a problem, you know, all of those stuff, you know, to think about the imagining what is happening in the network in your head, you know, right. to then all of those many discussion I had within that set up my career to uh, you know, when I switched to academic to do the set of research I ended up doing, that would not have happened if if it was not because of you. You know, <laughs> I would not be here today. You know, so to 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 yeah, tell you had a, you're having a, a wonderful career. I'm something to be very proud of. Uh, yep, and then, and thank you for that. So I really appreciate. I want to go back to something uh, about your childhood. Tell us a little bit about yourself growing up. Uh, I believe you grew up in New Jersey, and what led you to go to, you know, study electrical engineering, and then you went to Caltech for your PhD. So let's uh, touch on that side a little bit more. About well, okay. Um, hmm. Well, I guess um, both of my brothers were engineers, and um, you know, I had a family that uh, education was extremely central and important, but never pushed any particular direction. I would probably say that what really sparked a lot of interest was a friend of mine, I think it was in junior high, you know, in early teen, he was very interested in ham radio. <laughs> ah, okay, ham radio, yeah. okay. So, you know, I, started to get interested in ham radio and then of course with radio I was interested in electronics and i got so interested you know i i, I read every book about electronics i get my hands on. wow i mean yeah, out of the library and i remember reading some of the navy manuals on electronics and um building kits you know heath kits i don't know if you're heath kits but you could actually build your own transmitter and so forth and i got very deep into you know electronics and i just i guess uh that sort of was like i found what i was really interested in and uh, uh -huh. great and 
I don't know, I was, I was going to follow my brother, older brother into Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I was all accepted and everything, but then I participated in this uh, state competition. New Jersey was a Rutgers competition. Mm -hmm. you know, took, went down, took a test, and I took the test and thought nothing about it. Okay. And uh, it was a statewide thing, and I think I came in third. And that was, you know, a, a big honor, but I didn't win, and winning was a scholarship. Well, not too long after hearing that I took third, I got a letter sent offering me a scholarship to Rutgers. You know, I changed my plans. I'm going to Rutgers. No, it's not RPI. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Went to uh, electrical engineering. I mean, I, I knew I wanted to do that. And um, now I decided to go on for, I mean, I guess I thought I wanted to do graduate work. I, I didn't have yeah. any idea of doing a PhD, not at the time, but I went to talk one of the Rush, uh, Rutgers advisors, and I said, "You know, what do you where do you think I should apply?" I said, "Well, you got to apply to MIT and Portland and Caltech." <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I did, and um, I got into both, and I, you know, decided I, I like to try California, so yeah, Caltech it was, and uh -huh. so I did my master's degree and. Actually, I was able to do it in one year. And I had a good friend there uh, who decided that he was going to go on to his PhD. I had no idea that I was going to do. I was interviewing for, you know, actually interview Bell Labs. Uh -huh. and, and I was all set to, you know, to uh, go start working after my master's. And well, little by little. I decided, well, again, I, I, it was this interview test of sorts, you know, with the professors of Caltech. You go in and, you know, they question you and give you problems to solve at the board. I mean, they're sort of interviewing for scholarships for PhD candidates. So, uh -huh. lo and behold, <laughs> I came out of that and had an offer of a, of a NASA a NASA scholarship, a fellowship, but it's, you know, money, you didn't have to teach or anything. So, but little by little, I just decided that I could tend to go on and do my PhD. And, uh, in between that, I got married and had our first child. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I guess uh, mm -hmm. I sort of in evolved into, you know, being an engineer. And, and that, I think that's sort of what I was programmed to do. <laughs> right, absolutely. And, you know, and uh, uh, going back to your PhD at Caltech, uh, what was the, the, the topic of your PhD dissertation? You know, this is obviously, as we talked earlier, nothing to do with routing. We didn't nothing even know the word do. routing. So no, nothing so. to do with it. So interesting too. I was I was in, in control theory, an excellent control theory. Okay. Yeah, I was at optimal control theory. A mm -hmm. Professor named Sridhar, mm -hmm. who died very young, unfortunately, but extremely wonderful teacher. And um, I got uh, summer jobs at the Jet Proportion Lab (JPL), you know, just affiliated with Caltech. And um, got into a, uh, a, 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 a division that was responsible for uh, guidance of um, interplanetary vehicles, particularly ones that use ion engines. You know, it's a low thrust uh, type of an engine. It's not like the high, mm -hmm. the, the chemical engines, but they would accelerate ions and um, you know very low thrust but very efficient and there were problems about guiding these um, in stochastic you know, disturbances and so forth so I worked on that problem at JPL and um, a couple of summers and actually I think 
that was probably one of the reasons that JPL awarded Sridhar a contract, not only for doing studies on this guidance that I was involved mm -hmm. in, but also to work. Um, a good a colleague of mine was working on minimum energy control, which was, you know, very interested, interesting for JPL people because they had these little robots on the on Mars that roamed around and they wanted to maximize, you know, minimize the energy, make maximum use of the energy. And he worked on that optimization problem. So we got a contract to do this work. And well, I, I continued to work on this optimization and guidance, did some some analysis, and, uh, you know, what I had to do to get my PhD dissertation. So mm -hmm. it's a optimal guidance of low thrust interplanetary space vehicles. That's the wow. title of the thesis. I mean, you could still use those techniques for the interplanetary vehicle that everybody starts talking about now, Jerry. So, you know, maybe you have a second career, you know, at this point <laughs> in your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, they did use the uh, IN engines in a, in a couple of their probes, yeah. Really? Went to the asteroids, yeah. Wow, very interesting. Okay, yeah. that's another interesting contribution which I didn't know about. So this has been very interesting, Jerry, too. I mean, I knew a few things because I worked, you know, in your group under you. And But uh, to be able to get a broader picture perspective of where you started, you know, and where how you essentially stumbled into problems, sort of a way to see what contributions you, you made. So, do, so I guess my last set of question is that you know, I mean, based on your experience over your life, I mean, what are your thoughts? What, I mean, how do you go about, you know, looking at a problem or, or the unknowns in life? What sort of things do you want to share with the new generation? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what have I learned? Yes, right. <laughs> well, I mean, it's hard to hard to summarize that. I, I guess I don't know exactly what you're asking me, but no, um, I'm interested in some vice president one, once asked me, where does your where does your creativity come from? Aha, uh -huh. okay, <laughs> right. That's a good um, question. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we were there at or at the table and the other two gentlemen said, you don't have to answer that. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> I don't remember what I said, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. What would it, you know, I got very interested in the last, you know, five or 10 years and more philosophical things. I guess that's where what right. we're asking. And, right, uh, exactly. And, that's what I'm asking. To, right. say, uh, <laughs> Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? I actually wrote a book recently. Really? Self oh. self published book. Okay, I got to get a hold of the book. Oh uh, well, it might not be exactly what you're looking no, no. for. But That's okay. It's a uh, you know, it, it talks about um, you know my own ideas, and I go far enough to call it a theory. <laughs> Theory of all knowledge, and, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've just uh, I've been thinking of this for, you know, like I said, four, you know, five years and more. I mean, kind of started to think about this on my like uh, 70, 70th mm -hmm. birthday. The title of the book is "I Am 70: Going on Infinity." Oh, okay, cool. I like the title. <laughs> and, so uh, I started working on it when I was 70 years old. Now I'm 81. And, you know, so I was, I just published it like two years ago. And, uh, okay. It's a self published book. Okay. I didn't try to, you know, go to a publisher or anything. So, um, and, you know, it kind of lays out 
you know, my answer is where does creativity come from? Uh huh. Okay. Which you know, maybe is all wet. Who knows? You know, and uh, that underlying everything is knowledge. And uh, right, mm -hmm. you look at look at everything. You know, and look at the most detailed uh, description of a cell or whatever you want to pick you know you just keep going down 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 and it's just underlying it all is is what i say is knowledge <laughs> right <laughs> this, that's, is, that's this a... is what put this together i mean it's it's yeah. there because it exists that knowledge is there mm -hmm. and i said i can see with everything assembled in all knowledge and what takes the all knowledge to um reality is energy so all knowledge plus energy is everything. It's kind of the gist of it. That's 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 a very, very good summary. Knowledge, knowledge and energy, you know. So yeah. that creates a, a very, very that's fantastic. So yeah. that's what I was getting to. So yeah. do, um I presume you're trying to grab some. Okay. How do I how do I get a cup hold up a copy of this? It's self on it's on it's on Amazon. Oh, okay, I will find it on Amazon then <laughs> and I get a copy, order a copy. So that'll be fun to read it. Uh, do you have uh, Jerry? It's been again great pleasure catching up with you here. You know about your life and the work. Uh, you know the contribution you have made to uh, science and the society. You know, I mean so. And so uh, do you have any parting uh, comments before we uh, close off this session? Well, it's been a pleasure reconnecting with you, Deep. And I mean, it reminds me of, like I said before, um, how I was able to work and privileged to work with people like you. And you know, that is a very big part of my life. 